is Jonathan Shanzer. Jonathan, good morning, pal. How are you? Good morning. How you doing? Did Dubo tell you the same thing? This was his uh, his uh, prize moment. He did. He did. <laughs> Better than Charlie Rose. He wasn't lying. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, you guys do a terrific job, and uh, he was great last time. But I will tell you this. I have a listener. I told him the same story, uh, Jonathan. I have a listener in Virginia Beach. I don't know who, who she is, this lady. And she, for some reason, she loves you guys. And she goes, listen, Dubo was great. But, and, I, and I told Dubo the same thing. But if you get any guy, any guy from the uh, FDD, you got to get Jonathan Shanzer. And I'm like, why? Well, what's so great about Jonathan Shanzer? She's like, he's as smart as Dubo, but even more personality. So is that true? Well, I don't want to compare myself to Dubo, but yes. <laughs> That's, that's basically it. There, there you go. That's that's why you're beloved and revered all over the world. Let's get right to it, Jonathan Shanzer. When this deal went, you know, I'll tell you what it was like for me, okay? I'll give you a little, uh, a little analogy. You know when you have a relative that's really, really sick for a long time, right? And you think you're preparing for their death, and then they die, and you're, like, really upset about it? Sure. Okay. Well, this Iran deal was kind of like that for me. I knew it was going to get through. I knew it. I was preparing myself for it. But when the announcement came out yesterday that they reached 34, I was sick to my stomach. And I tweeted, is this really a Mike America? We're doing this? So what was your reaction? Well, my reaction was basically yours, that uh, this is something, I mean, it was, a, it was a slow motion train wreck. We could see it coming for, for miles away. Uh, we knew that uh, ultimately uh, President Obama would prevail over this. He would get the deal passed. Uh, I think what to me was the most sickening was, I, I, you know, I think many uh, opponents of the deal were, were, were sort of uh, pinning all of their hopes on Congress. At the end of the day, Congress just does not have the chops. When you look historically at what Congress has done in the, uh, in the 20th and 21st century, they are just not up to the challenge of, uh, you know, battling with the president. And so they folded like cheap suits, as a friend of mine uh, just quipped yesterday. And, uh, and so now we're, we're back where we thought we would be, which is the president has rammed this through. And uh, the only thing we can think about now is how to mitigate the damage, how to make sure that over the next year and a half things don't get any worse. Uh, because, uh, you know, quite a bit of damage can be done before this president leaves office. I want to go right to New York. Chuck Schumer comes out and says, uh, no thanks. But then Nadler, who is uh, his constituency up in New York, is more Jewish than any other, huge population. He comes out and says yes. So I'm on Twitter and talking to folks. I'm going, well, what could possibly be his motivation to say yes? He's Jewish. Obviously, Iran wants to destroy Israel. You know it's a bad deal. And the, the consensus was, the contention was, Jonathan, that Obama must have promised him something, that somewhere along the line, the federal government is going to do something for Nadler, making it worth his while to vote yes on this deal. Do you believe that's true? Look, I think that has been the case with just about every one of these members of Congress who've been struggling with the deal. I think most members do realize how incredibly flawed this deal is, and some of them uh, will admit this privately in conversations, but publicly have come out and supported the deal. And so that leads one to believe that what we're talking about is a lot of horse trading that's going on behind the scenes. We understand that some of this might be the threat of getting primaried. Uh, by the Democratic Party, that if you go against the president, the president will go against you the next time you stand for an election. That could be part of it, but there could be other things, deal sweeteners and the like. We've heard of one congressman, for example, who was getting flown around on Air Force One because he was on the fence. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you, know, um, you know, special perks and that kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, you don't get a sense, I think, the average American doesn't get a sense of how much of this wheeling and dealing takes place on Capitol Hill. Some of the fears is that this money that we're sending to Iran will be used to uh, go to Hamas, go to Hezbollah, go to Al-Qaeda, go who knows, ISIS, all these groups that are destroying the Middle East. And some of the fear, quite frankly, Jonathan, is that money is going to go to groups that are going to come here and kill us. So when you open the conversation by saying, hey, look, this thing is going through now, we can't stop it. The best we can hope for is to mitigate the damage. What exact damage are you talking about? Well, look, you know, what you're talking about is, A, you know, we talked about the 100 to $150 billion. Uh, the administration has been playing the accountant and the lawyer uh, of Iran over the last couple of months, saying, well, that money's not going to go to terrorists. Well, even if 10 percent of that money goes to terrorists, you're talking about $10 billion. And when we talk about those terrorists, yeah, you're talking about Hamas. 
uh, and you're talking about Palestinian Islamic Jihad, but also groups that have killed Americans in Iraq, like uh, the Hezbollah Brigades. Uh, that's a Shia militia. You're looking at uh, the Houthis, for example, in Yemen, uh, who are destabilize, destabilizing that country and extending the war there. Uh, you're talking about the Assad regime in Syria, where 250,000 people have been killed over four years. Uh, and then, you know, the, the last thing that, that you've got to just think about is the uh, Revolutionary Guards, the IRGC, as they're known. This is the special forces of the Iranian regime, uh, the Praetorian Guard. Now, we've, we know that the IRGC has been involved in extraterritorial terrorist attacks, uh, both against the United States and against others in the past. A couple of years ago, there was an attack on, or, or a thwarted attack on the Saudi ambassador at a restaurant here in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and it was Iranian-sponsored. And so you don't know where the money's going to go, but you know that Iran has this horrible track record of sponsoring terrorism worldwide, and the idea that we would be giving them cash and access to our banking system, which is the other component of this deal that has really gone unnoticed. You know, we're giving them the means to deliver those funds around the world legally. It's just astounding that this would happen. Why then? Uh, I use this. I coined this, actually. Dubo loved it. Chuck Todd loves it. Uh, Obama, to me, is a guy that wants to fill up the back of his baseball card. But you know, as a baseball fan, is about uh, uh, you know statistics, basically. That's all he's concerned about. Not safety, not patriotism, not Jews, none of that. Just filling up the back of his baseball card. Uh, and the folks that like this deal will tell you, no, 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 listen, we know the Ayatollah hates America. We know there are other government officials that hate America. But uh, we really believe that there's a large percentage of folks in Iran that would like to make nice, that would like to make peace. Do you really think our government officials believe that? Look, I actually believe that the people of Iran are largely pro-American. You hear about how uh, in private the women will wear makeup and listen, and the men will, you know, will wear ties, and, and they listen to American music, and uh, you know, they appreciate American culture. I have no question about that. And we saw that in 2009 when hundreds of thousands of people went out into the streets contesting the election of Ahmadinejad and calling for the end of, uh, uh, of this regime in Iran. That's not my question right now. Okay, what I I mean, by the way, I mean, I would say that, that the deal, in fact, uh, supports the regime itself, right? We legitimized the, the regime by signing this deal with them. We've given uh, the supreme leader a sense that, that he's being recognized by the United States, and so we're undercutting the, uh, the so-called green movement in Iran, the people who are really for us. Now, the, the real question, though, and I, had a, uh, I went to a party recently where I was really the skunk at the picnic. These were, uh, <laughs> uh, these were Obama guys and, and uh, people that I used to work with at the Treasury Department, and I got into a knockdown, dragout fight at this poor guy's 40th birthday party. And, uh, you know, we were talking, we were debating the deal, and I said, you know, tell me what we got out of it. Honestly, tell me what the one thing is that America gains from this. And, and the answer that I got essentially was that, Amer uh, that America is no longer on war footing with Iran. That's what we got oh out of it. God. That we were able to defer oh. war for mm. 10 to 12 years. Right. And that no one knows whether we'll go to war after that. Right. But at least right now what we have is, uh, is calm and we allow for cooler heads to prevail for mm. now. Mm. What, they don't, what they're not noting, though, is that Iran is going to get stronger militarily. Of course. It, right, the arms embargo is gone. The ballistic missile embargo is gone. They're going to have a, an industrial-sized nuclear program in 10 years. Right? So what you're going to be dealing with is a much nastier Iran in 10 or 12 years. They can get those ballistic missiles, if I'm correct here. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know more about this than I do. Eight years, and then the nuclear stuff will be bigger, better than ever in 10 to 12, right? That's right. That's right. And the, and the regular arms embargo is often five. So imagine what happens when this deal sunsets and we now go back to the table and we say, Ron, we, we still don't want you to go nuclear. And they say, well, now we got everything we need. <laughs> right, plus, plus we have $150 billion sitting in the bank and we've been selling oil. Uh, you know, because now there's no longer a, uh, a moratorium on that. So what you've got now is a much stronger Iran financially as well as militarily. And so whatever conflict that we think we've put off for the next 10 or 12 years is going to come back with nastier teeth the next time around. Mm. Jonathan Shanzer, the VP of Research for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, uh, uh, formerly with the Treasury Department and finance analyst and uh, just uh, all-around uh, genius. Hey, John, tell me this. from Just from the, the social aspect uh, with Iran, we'll get back 
back to the 24 days and the money and all that uh, silly stuff. Uh, this is a, a country that still throws gay people off the roofs. They still rape, torture, and kill their women. Here we've got a president that not that long ago, on a day, mind you, on a day, mind you, when there were three terrorist attacks around the world, was very okay lighting up the White House in all those lovely colors to celebrate gay marriage, which I'm okay with, by the way. But the point is, it seems like we've come so far socially, uh, l- social issues here in the United States, and we do a deal with a country that is basically a thousand years behind. How do we make an excuse for that? We can't. I mean, look, you know, you can't say that you are for human rights um, and, uh, you know, and then get behind this deal. You can't say that you're behind gay rights and get behind this deal. You can't say that you're trying to fight terrorism and get behind the deal. I mean, yesterday I was, I was, I, I was sort of horsing around on, on Twitter, but I was watching all these people who were responding to that horrible picture of this uh, Syrian toddler who washed up on the show. Let let me cut you off right now, because this was the tweet of the day. I'm glad you're about to bring this up. The the three-year-old toddler who washed ashore. Uh, Everybody was uh, disgusted over that. New York Daily News. And I'm glad you brought this up, because I I actually printed this tweet, Shanzer, before the show, because I thought it was brilliant. Here's Jonathan Shanzer's Twitter account. Tweeting about the horrors of Syria's refugee crisis while simultaneously defending the Iran deal is like smoking a butt out of lung cancer. Well, I mean, this was this was by far the smartest tweet I saw all day yesterday. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I mean, really, that that's what's so what's crazy about this. And so you have all these people out there who are telling us that there's no better deal and that this deal is going to bring peace to the Middle East. Right. You're not bringing peace to the Middle East. What you're doing is that you're empowering the worst people in the Middle East to continue to wage their war against Syrians, against gays, against Baha'i, against these minorities, uh, and, and by the way, against the Israelis, against the, the, the Iraqis. The Iranians are the nastiest regime in mm. the region, and we have just legitimized them, we have financed them, and we are giving them, promising them, a, an industrial-sized nuclear program after 10 to 12 years. Amazing. And then the, the 24 days you heard Donald Trump say there, it's probably longer than that. And then this is really the coup de grace. This is the one that... I just can't figure out. Uh, They get to inspect themselves. Explain that to me. That's right. There are, that there are some areas where the Iranians will say, well, look, this is just too sensitive, and we don't want you near a military site. And so what we promise we're going to do is we're going to give you our own soil sample. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, this is remarkable, right? This is ignoring the fact that Iran has been cheating all along and that they have been, I mean, just mendacious about their nuclear program. They're lying rapaciously. And here we're asking them, we're trusting them to be part of their own self-inspection. Regime And by the way, they also get a chance in the event of those alleged violations in the 24-day waiting period, they also get to adjudicate on their own uh, <laughs> alleged violations. About, and, and by the way, Sid, I mean, the deal gets even more bizarre as you read on. I mean, part of uh, the deal expects the United States to defend Iran against any possible sabotage of its nuclear program, either cyber or military. Well, let me ask you that, then. That brings up an interesting point, because our ally, of course, is Israel. Now, we know Obama can't stand Israel. This deal, if this deal doesn't scream of anti-Semitism, I don't know what does. But what if, in fact, Netanyahu decides, you know what, screw the United States. They're going to blow us up at some point, Iran. We're going to take action first. If Israel gets into a conflict with Iran, what do we do? Because in the deal, we're supposed to protect Iran. That's right. And so, I mean, look, I think the Israelis probably know that for the next year and a half, they can't, right? They just cannot disrupt the so-called peace deal that's been struck by this administration. The next administration, you know, the, the Israelis may have some flexibility. And so that's why, I mean, I wrote a piece for Huffington Post a couple of, uh, a couple of days ago where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying that I think that, you know, far from saying that we're, we're now going to not have war in the Middle East, I think it almost guarantees a war, not between Israel and Iran, but between Israel and Hezbollah, which is Iran's top proxy, its most prized proxy in the Middle East, the Israelis are going to look to make an example of anyone who trifles with them over the next year and a half. And that war could get very ugly. I mean, Hezbollah has 100,000 rockets right now facing southward at Israel, and the Israelis are not looking to play for a tie. They will want to win. Mm. And so you could have a very, very nasty war looming as a result of the constraints put on the Israelis from this deal. Now, they got the 34 yesterday. If they get, again, these are specific, uh, specifics of the
of the deal, which I don't think America knows. I got to be honest. Here's my contention, Jonathan. If I'm wrong, you tell me. Democrats, for example. And I know Republicans also signed up for the deal, too, which is hard to believe. But if you're a liberal, you're basically saying, I, I trust Obama. I love Obama. I've got guys telling me he's the best president of all time. I will tell you, in my lifetime, I think he rivals Jimmy Carter for the worst. But they love this guy. So whatever he says, whatever he does, they're going to sign on. I don't believe they have any idea what this deal uh, entails. Do you agree with that? Look, I think they have, I mean, uh, most members of Congress have done a lot of outreach to both, uh, you know, proponents and opponents of this deal. And I think they have studied the deal. I think they understand the deal. I don't think they're under any illusions of what this deal is going to bring for them next, bring for this country, and bring for the Middle East. They are aware of that. I think ultimately they, they, they had to make a decision about whether they were going to tangle with the president, whether they wanted another year and a half of pain in dealing with this president mm-hmm. who could make their lives very miserable. Again, this is something, and I think you, you alluded to this, that the president has decided to stake his legacy on this, that he really has not accomplished much of anything with, uh, in, in the foreign policy realm. I mean, yeah, you had the killing of bin Laden. That was in his first term. Okay, and then I, I, I suppose that probably the next uh, big achievement was uh, was taking Cuba off the terrorism list, and I'm not sure that's an achievement at all. Okay, in the meantime, what you have is the Arab Spring wreaking havoc around the region. You've got the Ukraine crisis. You've got, uh, I mean, you've just got a mess internationally. And so this president has decided that this is going to be his legacy. That he's, I mean, you, you called it the, fi- the filling out of the back of his baseball card. That's essentially what this is. And so, uh, you know, any member of Congress that's going to get in his way, he's already made it clear that he will make their lives miserable. And that is the way that politics works here in Washington. So last one, and I hate to say this because I thought Dubo was spectacular, but uh, they may have been right. You may be Dubo with more personality. (laughs) Don't tell him I said that, Jonathan. I'm serious. I won't, and I'm sure he won't be able to find that anywhere. (laughs) Well, when you send him today's interview, of course he's going to hear it. Uh, (laughs) On a serious note, Americans, uh, they pay more attention to home. I understand that. And there are some that will say, listen, I, I don't want to send my soldiers there. Let them kill each other in the Middle East. I don't care. You know, they, they don't believe that it's eventually going to come here. Uh, but the folks that are always worried that it's coming here, right, ISIS, al-Qaeda, we, still, we live through 9-11. Does this deal, does this deal ensure or improve the odds somehow or another that Iran now with money can help make sure that there is, in fact, something that happens? We know about the Israelis. We know about Hezbollah. Uh, what about happening here? Well, look, I mean, I, I mentioned that that uh, that 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 thwarted attack uh, planned and, and executed by the Iranians against the uh, the Saudi ambassador here in Washington. Um, that's one example. We've seen extra tor- extraterritorial attacks in places like Argentina and Bulgaria. There's no reason why uh, the Iranians wouldn't at some point try to attack us by proxy. We've seen it over and over again. And look, the thing that I always point out is that you know everybody talks about how Iran and Israel um, are, are on a collision course. And you know, we, we know that the Iranians call Israel the little Satan. Well, you know who the great Satan is, right? That's the United States. Yes, they yeah. hate us. They yeah. burn our flag. Right. They, they, they vow time and again to destroy the United States. And you continue to see that kind of rhetoric from the supreme leader of Iran. Now, we don't know whether that means that he's willing to take a chance and attack us now or later. But I would just again say this, that if ultimately we determine that preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon is our top priority, we will not let them do that, we are going to have a hell of a time 10 mm. years down the line. Mm. And that's just that cannot be ignored. So if you are, are afraid of sending, uh, you know, our, our men and women in uniform to battle now, you have to think about the fact that we are very likely going to have to do the same thing 10 or 12 years from now, maybe sooner if Iran cheats, and there's a pretty good chance that that happens. So last one, if I'm correct, I believe it's paragraph 36, Jonathan, that states they can get out of this deal, and they should do it right away. Once they get the check, they should bolt, or we can get out of this deal. Uh, is it as easy as 2016 rolls along? If God is good to us, or to me, I shouldn't uh, uh, put my views on you. If God is good to me, there'll be a Republican in office. Is it as easy as that guy comes in? In and rips up this deal. How do we get out of this deal at this point? Look, there, there is no getting out of it anytime soon. In, in my opinion, I think it's going to be extremely difficult for for uh, a Republican president come, let's just say, February first, two thousand seventeen, to just come in and rip the thing up. But I do think that you know the fact that you've got this razor thin uh, major- um, or minority actually is what the president just achieved. I mean, he was able to it looks like circumvent a veto uh, and and secure the deal. But he didn't do it by a, a large margin, and I think that sets a precedent for uh, for 
the next commander in chief to come in and take a look at that deal. Uh, the other thing that we're hearing is that presidential candidates, you know, may begin to vow that they're going to do an assessment of the deal. In other words, are we seeing more weapons go to Syria? Are we seeing more weapons go to uh, Hezbollah? Are we seeing more weapons go to uh, to the Houthis in Yemen? Are, do we see the Middle East more or less dangerous as a result of this deal and the cash that went to Iran? Uh, and then more importantly, have we seen Iran cheat even on the margins of this deal? A couple centrifuges here or there, a little bit of additional enriched uranium here or there. All of these things can be something that the next president can look at and do a cost-benefit analysis of where we are with the deal. Was it worth it? And then they will have a mandate, of course, to be able to go back to our European partners, even the Russians and the Chinese, and say, all right, guys, this is not working out the way the last guy said it would. So we've got to have a talk, a serious talk, about what happens next with Iran. Yeah, that's been, that's, uh, that's been an excuse, too. Some of the folks that afford this deal go, hey, hold on a second, Sid. It's not just Obama. It's not just America. There are five European countries that are on board, too. What are you going to say to them? I say to them, I don't live in Paris. I don't care. <laughs> that's right. I mean, right? I mean, right or wrong, right? No, no, that's right. And, and look, and also, I mean, you've got to look at each of these countries. I mean, the Russians want to supply Iran with arms. So do the Chinese. So, of course, they're going to get behind this deal. The Europeans, are, I mean, they're afraid of their own shadow, and they're doing whatever the United States does uh, because they just don't have a backbone in terms of uh, international leadership. So I don't take them terribly seriously either right now. It was up to us to hold the line. We obviously didn't. Again, Congress seems to have folded here, which is incredibly disappointing, but I think is very much in line with congressional history on uh, you know uh, on issues of national security and so we're just going to have to tread water here for a little bit try to mitigate what as I mentioned mitigate whatever damage can be done over the next year and a half try to prevent maybe some of these European companies from investing in Iran uh, try to make sure that people know about the dangers of working with the uh, Revolutionary Guard well, well, we, 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 we can maybe limit the European countries but you know as we speak already that Russian uh, Chinese interest companies they're going up as we speak right I mean as we're speaking it's going up that's right, and and you know, and that becomes a problem. But the thing is, is that when the when the rest of the world looks at Russia and China going in, they're saying, yeah, well, we knew that was going to happen. It's about the legitimate, you know, European co and Western companies that if you're able to prevent them, and you're able to make sure that the banks know that this is really dangerous, and this is a potential, uh, you know, kind of a sanction earning activity, or at least can get them in a lot of trouble a little bit further down the line. You know, there's one thing that multinational companies hate. And banks hate, and that's risk. Mm -hmm. And so if we can stress that for now, you may be able to prevent that flood and then hold the line for a little bit. But, you know, a lot of this right now, again, it's just damage control, given the fact that this very bad deal appears to be ready to go through. You're like the Michael Jordan of this conversation. I mean, you're, you're not even good, Chancellor. You're, you're incredible. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean you're, you're, you know, this is a 22-minute conversation, which for radio in this world is a very long conversation. It felt like five minutes, and you're so uh, learned and so good that I want to bring you on almost every single day. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. My pleasure.